This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 39, coming up on Space Time. A new study claims the same events could be triggering all of the Sun's violent eruptions. Scientists exploring the climate of Proxima B and NASA's Cosmic Ray Balloon mission forced to terminate early. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims violent eruptions on the Sun may all be triggered by the same process, regardless of their size. The findings reported in the journal Nature contradict previous ideas that different sized eruptions were being caused by different processes. Understanding solar eruptions is important as their electromagnetic radiation causes geomagnetic storms, often referred to as space weather or solar storms. When these storms hit the Earth, they affect the planet's protective magnetic field, causing charged particles to accelerate along the Earth's magnetic field lines towards the north and south magnetic poles, where they collide with gases such as oxygen and nitrogen in Earth's atmosphere, triggering spectacular aurora light shows at higher latitudes, known as the aurora borealis and aurora australis, the northern and southern lights. However, space weather can also damage and destroy satellites by frying their delicate electronics with ionized particles. They also affect the density of molecules around spacecraft, increasing atmospheric drag, which then causes orbital degradation, shortening a spacecraft's useful lifespan. The radiation from these geomagnetic storms also poses a significant danger to astronauts. They can also cause navigation and communication problems on the ground. They force aircraft away from polar routes, thereby increasing journey times and fuel consumption. And they can overload terrestrial power grids, causing widespread blackouts affecting millions of people. To try and understand what's happening, scientists looked at the mechanisms behind coronal jets and coronal mass ejections. Coronal jets are relatively small bursts of plasma which erupt from the sun. At the other end of the scale, coronal mass ejections are massive explosions, resulting in huge clouds of plasma and magnetic field being blown into deep space at high speed. Both types of eruptions were known to involve snake-like filaments of dense plasma low in the sun's atmosphere. But until now, exactly how they erupted at such vastly different scales was unclear. The authors found that the filaments in the jets are triggered to erupt when the magnetic field lines above them break and rejoin, a process known as magnetic reconnection. The same process has already been identified as the primary trigger for coronal mass ejections. The authors used 3D computer simulations to show that the strength and structure of the magnetic field around the filament determines the type of eruption to occur. The new study provides solid theoretical support for previous observational research which suggested that coronal jets were being caused by the same process which generates coronal mass ejections. The study's lead author, Dr Peter Wiper from Durham University, says the latest findings covered all solar eruptions from the largest coronal mass ejections right through to the smallest coronal jets. He says it was previously thought that there were different drivers for the varying scales of eruptions on the Sun. But excitingly, this new research provides a theoretical universal model for all this activity. Scientists call their proposed mechanism for how filaments lead to eruptions the breakout model. That's because of the way the stressed filament pushes relentlessly at and ultimately breaks through its magnetic restraints into space. Co-author Dr Richard DeVore from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says the breakout model unifies science's picture of what's going on at the sun. Within a unified context, scientists will be able to advance their understanding of exactly how these eruptions are started, how to predict them, and how to better understand their consequences. In future, the researchers plan to use further simulations in order to test their models for solar eruptions under different magnetic configurations, and to study how the swarms of high-energy particles which can affect spacecraft and astronauts are launched into space by these events. Confirming the theoretical mechanism will require high-resolution observations of the magnetic field and plasma flows in the solar atmosphere, especially around the Sun's poles, where many of these jets originate. The problem is that data is currently not available. So for now, scientists are looking towards upcoming missions, such as NASA's Solar Probe Plus and the joint European Space Agency NASA's Solar Orbiter mission, which will acquire novel measurements of the Sun's atmosphere and magnetic fields emanating from solar eruptions. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Scientists are taking their first tentative steps to study the climate of Proxima b, the nearest Earth-like planet beyond our solar system. Proxima b orbits Proxima Centauri, the closest neighbouring star to the Sun and the third star in the Alpha Centauri triple star system. Proxima Centauri is a spectral type M red dwarf star. It's about 0.123 times the mass of the Sun and about a seventh its diameter. The system's located some 41 trillion kilometres, or 4.224 light-years away. Proxima b was discovered in August 2016 by astronomers with the European Southern Observatory in Chile. It's about 1.3 times the mass of the Earth, and orbits its host star at a distance of roughly 7.5 million kilometres, with an orbital period of just 11.2 Earth days. That places Proxima b within its star's habitable zone, the so-called Goldilocks region, where temperatures are not too hot and not too cold, but just right for liquid water, essential for life as we know it, to pool on the surface of a terrestrial planet under the right atmospheric conditions. However, just because a planet's in the habitable zone doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be habitable. For example, besides the Earth, Venus, Mars, as well as the Earth's moon are all in the Sun's habitable zone. But the broiling heat of a runaway greenhouse effect, combined with sulfuric acid rain and crushing atmospheric pressure, makes life on Venus highly unlikely, despite it being similar in mass, size and composition to the Earth. As for the Earth's moon, it's too small to retain any atmosphere, and so the only lunar water is in the form of ice, frozen in the shadows at the bottoms of polar impact craters perpetually shaded from the Sun. And while Mars did once have a thick atmosphere, with vast amount of liquid water on its surface, the small planet's comparatively rapid cooling and the resultant solidification of its core shut down its protective magnetic field, allowing the solar wind to erode away most of the Martian atmosphere, blowing it into space and turning the red planet into a freeze-dried desert. As for Proxima b, it's also thought to be uninhabitable, despite being in Proxima Centauri's habitable zone. That's because it's subjected to ferocious stellar winds from its host star, which is some 2,000 times stronger than the solar winds experienced by Earth. The key will be whether the planet has an atmosphere and magnetic field, and whether they're strong enough to provide any sort of protective shielding. Now, research on this nearby world has taken an exciting new twist, with a report in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics claiming computer simulation models are pointing to areas on Proxima b's surface where habitable conditions and liquid water could exist. Scientists from the University of Exeter use the British Met Office's Unified Model, a state-of-the-art weather and climate computer simulation, to explore the potential climate of the exoplanet with a longer-term goal of revealing whether Proxima b has the potential to support life. The same computer model has been used for several decades to study Earth's climate. The authors simulated the climate of Proxima b by giving it a similar atmospheric composition to the Earth. Now that could be a pretty long bow to draw, but at least it's a starting point. The team also explored a much simpler atmosphere comprising primarily nitrogen with traces of carbon dioxide, as well as variations in the planet's orbit. The results showed that Proxima b could have the potential to be habitable, and it could exist in a remarkably stable climate regime. Scientists examined a number of different scenarios for the planet's likely orbital configuration using a set of simulations. As well as looking at how the climate would behave were the planet tidally locked with the same side always facing Proxima Centauri and the other side always facing deep space, the team also looked at how an orbit similar to that of Mercury, which rotates three times on its axis for every two orbits of the Sun, known as a 3-2 resonance, would affect the planet's environment. One of the main features which distinguishes Proxima b from Earth is that the light from its host star is mostly in the near-infrared range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the thing is, near-infrared light would interact far more strongly with both water vapour and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that in turn would affect the climate. Using the Met Office software, 
the team found that both tidally locked and 3-2 resonance configurations resulted in regions of the planet which were able to host liquid water. However, the 3-2 resonance example resulted in more substantial areas of the planet falling within this temperature range. Additionally, they found that the expectation of an eccentric orbit could lead to a further increase in the habitability of this world. One of the study's authors, Dr Nathan Main, says the project's trying to help scientists better understand the huge diversity of exoplanets being discovered, and to exploit this to hopefully improve understanding of how the Earth's own climate has evolved and changed. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. OK, now let's take a break from our show and welcome a new sponsor, Marley Spoon. One of the guys who helps me produce Space Time, Hugh, put me on a Marley Spoon. Tell me all about it. What they do is they create these really nice recipes, source all the ingredients and everything, pack them up into a nice big box and send them to you. Nice and easy. And talk about making cooking simple. You've put me on a Marley Spoon because you're a bit concerned about my diet, which is primarily <laughs> takeaway. So, <laughs> I, I reckon, Stuart, if you tried Marley Spoon, we could change you. We could, we could sway you over to becoming a chef. That's how good they are, I reckon. Because I'm not a chef. And I ordered it up to give it a try for the program. And the recipes that they supplied... Are they hard to follow? No, simple. And in no time at all, you've made something really nice. And even my children were quite complimentary about the food. And that never happens in our household, I have to tell you. Now, I've got to tell you, I can burn water. Can I follow these instructions? You could follow these instructions, Stuart. Anybody could follow these instructions. They are so simple. I mean, as I said, I am not a chef. And I was turning out these gourmet dishes that I could fake my way through. It was fantastic. All right. What about if you've got special tastes? Like, for example, I'm a vegan. Yep, they've got you covered, Stuart. No problems at all. You will find vegan options on the menu. I'm gluten-free, for instance, and I was able to find some gluten-free options on there as well. Is it expensive? No, it's not expensive at all. We were able to absorb it within our normal weekly grocery shop bill. We have a certain budget each week for groceries, and we were actually able to reduce our supermarket shop as a result. Now, Stuart, we've got a really special offer for our Space Time fans. If you're living in Australia, head over to marleyspoon.com.au, and when you sign up and use the code SPACE on the check out, you'll get $35 off your very first order. And for our North American listeners in the USA, if you go to marleyspoon.com, you can use space at the checkout as well and get $30 off your first order as well. So Marley Spoon, changing the way you cook. And now, back to our show. A NASA mission involving a giant football stadium-sized balloon has been terminated early, splashing down in the eastern South Pacific Ocean, 320 kilometres south of Easter Island. The mission, which was designed to study mysterious cosmic rays entering the Earth's atmosphere, apparently developed a leak three days into the flight. The 18.8 million cubic foot, that's 532,000 cubic metre heavy lift superpressure balloon, had launched 12 days earlier from Wanaka in New Zealand, and was expected to fly for at least 100 days floating around the planet in the Southern Hemisphere's mid-latitude band. However, flight controllers at NASA's Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility in Texas decided the leak was serious enough to force a controlled flight termination of the balloon, causing it to slowly descend back to the surface. The balloon was designed to float for extended periods at a stable altitude of about 33.2 kilometres, or 109,000 feet, despite the normal heating and cooling of the day-night cycle. However, the balloon started experiencing significant altitude drops at night when the temperature dropped, regaining its predicted altitude during the day as the temperature rose again. Flight controllers dropped ballast to manage altitude loss during cold storms, which can see atmospheric temperatures fall to minus 50 degrees and below. However, by the 11th day of the flight, the team were left with just 34 kilograms of ballast, and they were still well over 3,000 kilometres from the South American mainland. Facing poor weather forecasts, which could lead to even lower altitudes with little ballast remaining, NASA decided to preemptively end the mission, ensuring the greatest level of control and safety during descent. The agency had already conducted an environmental analysis of an open ocean landing before beginning its mid-latitude flight program in 2015. The open ocean flight termination procedure makes use of the 2.5-ton flight payload as an anchor to pull the entire balloon flight train to the bottom of the ocean as quickly as possible. In this way, the balloon doesn't remain for long in the primary water column zone where most of the marine species live, thereby minimising environmental impacts. Head of NASA's balloon program office, Debbie Fairbrother, says it's unfortunate the mission had to come to a premature ending. Still, more than 60 gigabytes of data was successfully downloaded before the mission terminated. 
Mission managers expect to have collected a significant amount of data during the flight, which will now be analysed over the coming weeks and months to try and determine exactly what went wrong. In other words, what caused the leak. Fairbrother says the lessons learned from this flight will be applied to future missions to continue developing the technology. While the primary objective of this mission was always to validate the super-pressure balloon technology, the opportunity was taken to include the International Extreme Universe Space Observatory payload on the mission to study high-energy cosmic ray particles reaching the Earth from deep space. Cosmic rays are relativistic subatomic particles, primarily high-energy protons and atomic nuclei, as well as electrons, photons and occasionally short-lived positrons, the antimatter counterpart to the electron. When they reach Earth's atmosphere, they produce showers of secondary particles, primarily hadrons. These air showers can be many kilometres wide, cascading ionised particles and electromagnetic radiation. However, the unstable hadrons quickly decay into other particles. These include X-rays, neutrons, electrons, positrons, heavy versions of electrons called muons, protons, antimatter versions of protons called antiprotons, alpha particles, which comprise two protons and two neutrons in a particle very similar to a helium nuclei, and pions, which are short-lived particles consisting of an upquark and a down antiquark. These secondary particles can sometimes reach the Earth's surface. Also, as these high-energy cosmic ray particles first enter the atmosphere, they interact with nitrogen molecules in the air, producing ultraviolet photons. The scientific package on the balloon was designed to detect these telltale ultraviolet fluorescent signatures. The origin of cosmic rays remains a mystery. It's been speculated that they could be generated by black holes as they fed on material that ventures too close. If that were the case, then they could be an extension of quasars. Another possible source are the rapidly rotating lighthouse-like beams generated by spinning neutron stars called pulsars. While a third hypothesis involves the explosive deaths of stars in supernova events. All three mechanisms provide particle accelerators powerful enough to accelerate cosmic rays to relativistic speeds. The International Extreme Universe Space Observatory payload was designed to hunt for these most energetic cosmic ray particles ever observed under the severe operating conditions of the stratosphere. The mission's principal science investigator, Professor Angela Alinto from the University of Chicago, says while the flight was cut short, she's confident that the super-pressure balloon approach to observing cosmic ray particles will pioneer a new understanding of these extreme phenomena. Also flying aboard the mission was a single poppy in commemoration of Anzac Day, the National Day of Remembrance, to pay tribute to the sacrifices made by Australian and New Zealand soldiers to protect democracy and freedom around the world. It's the local version of America's observance to Memorial Day. NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia manages the agency's scientific balloon flight program, with between 10 and 15 flights every year from launch sites worldwide. Orbital Sciences, which operates NASA's Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility in Texas, provides mission planning, engineering services and field operations for NASA's scientific balloon program. In its more than 35 years of operation, the team has now launched more than 1,700 scientific balloons. To find out more about this mission, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. It is something called a superpressure balloon. This is not a hot air balloon. It's basically a helium balloon. Very heavy lift is what we're being told. I think the payload is something like two and a half tonnes that it has underneath it, which is quite astonishing. You think of uh, balloons as, as being things that lift relatively uh, lightweight loads, but this thing carrying, as I said, two and a half tons, apparently the real reason for launching this balloon to test out the technology. It's all about testing these new generation of heavy lift, high altitude balloons to make sure that basically that, that they've got everything right. Launching balloons, you know, we think of it, oh yeah, you just blow it up and send yeah, it off. Yeah, you just fill it with hot uh, air and, you know. But not when they're going up to 30 or 40 kilometres, which is the basically the height that this balloon will go to. Mm. When a balloon goes up to that sort of height, when it's got a sort of, um, you know, a fixed amount of the, the gas within it that's going to lift it, they expand enormously to be the size of a football stadium. Good it, it's going to be... Is this and, the sort of balloon that Felix Baumgartner used to get up so high and... That's right. It's actually, jump. I think it's, I, I think it's a high tech version of of, uh, of the same sort of thing. Yes, he, I think he jumped from about 30 kilometres. Yeah. 
yes. uh, if I remember rightly. So it, it, it is a similar device, but of course it doesn't have the capsule underneath. It's got a robotic payload. And what is interesting about it is that a balloon that big will actually be visible from the ground, even at 30 or 40 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So just turning to the scientific payload, mm. um, High energy cosmic rays are really a mystery in terms of where they originate from. So cosmic rays are subatomic particles that enter the atmosphere and we've known about them for at least 100 years. I, I do recall reading about early balloon experiments in the early part of the 20th century and with people trying to take things called electroscopes up into the upper atmosphere to see if they could detect these particles coming in. But the way the present experiment will find these things is that when high energy subatomic particles wherever they come from, when they hit the atmosphere, they actually interact with the nitrogen molecules in the air and they cause it to fluoresce. They cause the nitrogen molecules to, to light up, but it's actually in ultraviolet light. It's not visible light. So this is uh, more violeter than violet light, if mm. we can put it that way. And so the spacecraft or the, the balloon craft carries ultraviolet detectors to sense the flashes that are going to come from these high energy cosmic rays. And it's by doing that and by analysing the ultraviolet that you can get an idea of the energy that the cosmic ray itself has when it hits the atmosphere. And that, people hope, will narrow down the possibilities as to where these things come from. The origin of the, the particles is, is an enormous mystery. People have speculated perhaps the black holes at the centres of galaxies are the source of these things, or pulsating stars, these tiny neutron stars that spin very rapidly and emit pulses of radiation. But do they they also emit subatomic particles. We don't know. And uh, ultimately, I suppose, if we can figure these cosmic rays, subatomic sub 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 particles out, we'll maybe answer other questions that we don't know. Uh, much about at the moment. It, it, that's, that's always the way. You can bet your life that, you know, once they've narrowed down the possibilities for these subatomic particles, there will be other questions that arise. That's the nature of science. The more questions you answer, the more you uncover, mm. which can be frustrating, but it is it's enormously satisfying when you find the answer to a question. That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Ariane Space has successfully launched two telecommunications satellites into orbit. The Ariane 5 blasted off from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, carrying the Brazilian and South Korean satellites. A tout de vidéo, attention pour les décomptes finales. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage Vulcain. Ariane 5 beginning her mission, lifting off beautifully from the ground here in French Guiana with a lot of fire. Beginning her mission, the fourth for Ariane Space this year, with her two new satellites for different regions, for Latin America and for Asia, making her way up through the clouds, which have passed over us, giving us a great... DDU says everything is well on board. The two boosters are providing 99.0% of the thrust, propelling the launcher along her trajectory at an ever higher velocity. 775 tons at liftoff. That's a total mass. She's burning five tons of fuel every second, two and a half tons in each booster, and another 300 kilos in the core stage. Ariane 5 is now following the propulsion in the onboard computer, which gives all the orders. The DDO says everything is fine on board. We're in the first of four flight phases. Ariane, as she heads east across the Atlantic right now, the first flight phase, the single core stage engine and the boosters are burning. 
booster is going to burn for another 20, 25 seconds. Extinguished. We're 15 kilometers from the launch pad here in Jupiter, but even here you can feel the sensation of liftoff. And at about a minute and 30 seconds after launch, the delayed sound comes over here. There is the flame out of the booster. And the DDO has confirmed it. The flamed out booster is trailing a little smoke. The two boosters fall 500 kilometers from shore in a protected area. In two minutes, Ariane has already hit a speed of over two kilometers per second. The speed we need to inject a satellite is roughly nine kilometers per second. Kilometers. The DDO has called out separation of the fairing. We can separate the fairing because we're out of the dense layers of the atmosphere, over 100 kilometers up. Aboard Ariane Space Flight VA-236 was Brazil's 5,735 kilogram geostationary satellite for communications and defense, better known as the SGDC. It was released into its transfer orbit about 28 minutes after launch. The spacecraft will provide Brazil with broadband and strategic communications capabilities for the next 18 years. Just eight minutes after Brazil's deployment, the 3,680-kilogram KoreaSat-7 was released into its own geostationary transfer orbit. This satellite will provide telecommunications and broadcasting services over Korea, the Philippines, Indochina, India and Indonesia for the next 15 years. The total payload mass for this launch was 10,289 kilograms. That includes the satellites, the payload adapters and the carrying structures. And the flight was the 92nd mission for the Ariane 5 rocket. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The shows also broadcast coast-to-coast coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. This edition of Space Time is brought to you by Marley Spoon.